Okay, wonderful to be here in your midst uh, in this symposium honoring Father Andrew Louth. Um, thank you for the invitation. I think you've put a very nice gathering together. I'm going to be speaking on the topic of Macarius as a dogmatic theologian. When I say Macarius, I mean the author of the large collection of materials ascribed often to Macarius of Egypt or sometimes to a certain Simeon. This is why we have the um, alternative titles for the collection Macarius Simeon or Pseudo Macarius. I, I hate the pseudo, so I, I just called him Macarius um, in what follows. And uh, this is taking me back actually to my first doctoral project, which uh, Metropolitan Callistos supervised and Father Andrew Louth examined. Um, so there's a nice connection there. Um, in the invitation to the symposium, um, Michael spoke of a move beyond the separation between theology and uh, spirituality, moving beyond that separation uh, in order to attain a new understanding of the vision of the Church Fathers. And I will try and um, contribute to that in the context of uh, Macarius, um, who is somebody who is often categorized simply as a spiritual or mystical theologian um, with no great doctrinal um, interest. Um, but before talking about the doctrinal um, interest of Macarius, let me just say a few words about this, this treatise, uh, these treatises, letters, homilies, um, question and answer sessions that we have under the name of Macarius. We can date them to something like the 370s to the 390s, possibly in Mesopotamia, um, um, northeastern Syria. Um, these are an extraordinary collection of texts bearing on virtually every aspect of the Christian life. Um, struggle against the passions, but especially the experience of the Holy Spirit. Um, um, tremendously influential in the later tradition in both East um, and West, and I, condemned four times by the Spanish Inquisition, which I always think is a bit of a badge of, a badge of honor. Uh, so these are you know, important collection of spiritual material from the late fourth century, but usually categorized as spiritual or mystical and therefore not proper theology, not proper dogmatic theology, not the proper theology we find in Athanasius or the Cappadocians, let's say, in the fourth century. Consequently, routinely ignored in virtually all accounts of um, the doctrinal controversies of the 4th and 5th century, so both in the matter of Trinitarian theology and Christology. And I'm going to focus on Trinitarian theology and Christology um, in what follows. I mean, one could say a good deal more about Macarius in respect of other doctrinal topics. Um, for instance, the uh, vision of God as light, as the summit and aim of the Christian life, is a distinctive feature of the Macarian corpus and becomes uh, one of the chief reference points of St. Gregory Palamas in the 14th century, precisely defending the possibility of the vision of God as uncreated light. And Macarius is a tremendously important figure. Um, you know, it seems to me the first person to speak uh, in categorical terms of the vision of God as uncreated light, as the summit apex um, of the Christian life, and taking the transfiguration um, as his base paradigm, visual aid note. We could also talk a lot about Macarius's contribution to theosis, the doctrine of deification. We could talk about Macarius's contributions in the matter of the spiritual senses in the relationship, the complex relationship between divine grace and human freedom. Um, in anthropology, an understanding of the human person as a psychophysical whole centered um, on the heart. Um, good many topics we could cover, but I'm gonna focus on these two big traditional theological loci, Trinitarian theology and Christology. Is it right that Macarius has been almost totally ignored? I mean, you can certainly read through any, any numbers of uh, works of history of doctrine, Dogma Geschichte, certainly doesn't come up in Harnack, um, certainly doesn't come up in the works which I encountered uh, when I was first studying uh, this period, uh, things like J.N.T. Kelly's Early Christian Doctrine, Hansen's Search for the Christian Doctrine of God, and even in some, some more recent, more cutting-edge stuff on fourth-century Trinitarian theology, e.g. Ayers, Anatolius, Macarius, does not um, appear. I mean, Car Macarius is not wholly ignored, of course, in studies of doctrine. There's a very fine book from the 1970s, Hermann Derry's Deep Theology of Des Macarius Simeon, Theology of Macarius Simeon, 
Um, John Meindorf makes a lot of Macarius in his um, study of uh, St. Gregory Palamas. But generally, it must be said that Macarius is almost totally ignored in terms of doctrinal controversies, 4th century, 5th century, precisely because he's categorized as a spiritual or mystical writer of no great dogmatic um, import. So this is why I'm speaking about Macarius as a dogmatic theologian. Um, another reason, I think, apart from this um, bifurcation of theology and spirituality or mysticism, this dichotomy, this artificial dichotomy between theology and spirituality, mysticism. Um, another reason why Macarius's contribution in the matter of Trinitarian theology and in the matter of Christology has not been properly appreciated is, I think, because of the widespread assumption that was pretty current in scholarly circles between roughly the 1920s and the 1990s that Macarius is simply a Messalian heretic and therefore um, not worthy of serious study. But through the work of people like um, Columbus Stewart and Klaus Fitchen and others, that kind of pan messalian attitude is now, I think, pretty much um, dead in the water. And it's um, time to really reappropriate Macarius as a dogmatic theologian and not only as a spiritual theologian. So turning, starting with Trinitarian theology, perhaps the most distinctive feature of Macarius's vision is his sense that it's the vision, experience, acquisition of the spirit that is um, at the heart of the Christian life. Um, when St. Seraphim, in his conversation with Motovilov, talks precisely about the acquisition of the spirit as the goal of the Christian life, he explicitly cites Macarius for this um, intuition. And Macarius had provided one of the fullest ever explorations and expressions of the role of the Holy Spirit in the late fourth century, precisely at the time when there was a good deal of theological discussion concerning the person and nature of the Spirit. In Macarius, we can see the emergence of a distinctive and profoundly experiential pneumatology um, within the Greek East, and which forms, I think, something of a golden chain of experiential pneumatology um, going through St. Simeon the Theologian and St. Gregory Palamas. Um, incidentally, I quite like pronouncing the P on pneumatological, um, a bit like the French do, <laughs> but uh, anyhow. So, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, um, Macarius, um, you know, it, it's, it's an experiential vision. He speaks about the way in which the Holy Spirit wrenches us out of the life of the passions in which we're embedded. And the gift of the Spirit brings us way beyond where Adam and Eve uh, started. Um, the incarnation, yes, restored to humankind the original nature of Adam, but in addition, bestowed upon it the heavenly inheritance of the Spirit, which is a kind of code for theosis or deification. Um, the Holy Spirit give the souls, gives to the soul wings to fly in the air of the divinity. And it's precisely this capacity of the Holy Spirit to incorporate us into the life of the Trinity, to deify us, that lies at the heart of Macarius's recognition of the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And he makes a lot of Romans 8 in this respect. Participation, deifying participation in the Spirit in Macarius is um, described with a stunning array of images um, and metaphors. Um, you, he speaks of the Holy Spirit as mother, but also as um, dew, wine, rain, seed, sea, spring, food, fire, air, farmer, bridegroom. Um, note the Holy Spirit is mother and bridegroom. I mean, that sort of uh, conjunction reminds us of the, um, well, the insufficiency of our own gender categories when talking about, when talking about God. Macarius makes it very clear when he's speaking of the experience of the Holy Spirit that this is not just some sort of metaphor or kind of analogy. When, for example, he speaks of the experience of the Holy Spirit as light, he says quite categorically this is not uh, a, a metaphor, not an analogy. The perfect mystery of Christianity, says Paul, is the experience, um, the Apostle Paul, of course, the experience through divine operation of the illumination of the heavenly light of the Spirit. Macarius goes on to say this talk of the light of the Holy Spirit in the soul is not just a revelation of knowledge and concepts, but the eternal illumination of the hypostatic light of the Spirit in the soul. And this experience of the Holy Spirit in the soul becomes kind of rooted in us, like a substance, he says, 
And it's through the experience of the Spirit that the revelation of the grace laid down within, within us in baptism becomes uh, manifest. And he's got a whole sort of sense of synergia or cooperation between God and man um, here. Note, note how experiential it all is. For Macarius, if you, if you, if you can't experience it, there's, there's something kind of missing. The reality of Christianity, says Macarius, is this. It's the tasting of truth, the eating and drinking of truth that's what Christianity is um, about. Now, we can say a good deal more about the, the life of the Spirit um, in, in Macarius's vision. It's certainly, there's a Eucharistic context, a baptismal context. Um, it seems to me that Macarius is somebody who very nicely brings together the four elements that Metropolitan Callistos was talking about. Uh, you know, scripture, doctrine, mystical experience, and liturgy. All of these are very clear in Macarius. Uh, Macarius will talk about a, a mingling with the Spirit, or the Spirit living within us. Again, going back to Romans 8, um, the, the, the Spirit become, cries, prays, knows, does the will of God in us, becoming a kind of second soul within us. And here he borrows a theme from the Syriac um, tradition with which he's closely connected. The acquisition of the Spirit brings us into a deifying union with God. Um, the Spirit quite literally abides in us becoming another soul within us, integrating us into the life of the Trinity. So Macarius will talk about the, the, the deification in quite graphic terms. In fact, there are very few people who, yes, they might affirm deification, but not necessarily say what it actually looks like. And Macarius really does say, at least as far as one is able, what it looks like. The soul, he says, in this deifying union with the spirit becomes all light, all spirit, all joy, or repose, or gladness, or love, or compassion, or goodness and kindness, as though it's been swallowed up in the virtues of the Holy Spirit, as a stone in the depths of the sea is surrounded by water. People who are transformed in this way are mingled with and embraced by the Spirit, united to the grace of Christ, assimilated to Christ, and presented by Christ to the Heavenly Father. So note how Trinitarian the dynamic of salvation is in Macarius. Spirit-centered, Christ-centered, Trinitarian. Now, moving on to somewhat more doctrinal matters, if one, that, that, that distinction really makes any sense at all, the divine status of the Spirit is in no doubt for Macarius. He calls the Holy Spirit uncreated and makes the argument that uh, we know the Holy Spirit is uncreated through the experience of deification. Only the divine can deify created beings. Very similar argument to what we find in Athanasius to Serapion or in the uh, Gregory the Theologian's fifth theological oration and in the other Cappadocian fathers. Well, how do we know the Spirit's God? Well, the Spirit deifies us. The Spirit could not deify if the Spirit were not God. Um, there's a fairly uh, definite logic here. I suppose the only difference here between Macarius and the proper fathers, Athanasius and the Cappadocians, proper dogmatic fathers, is that his approach is much more fundamentally experiential. But it seems to me the experiment experiential dimension is indispensable for dogmatic theology, whether in the 4th century or the 21st century. I've mentioned the Cappadocian Fathers, and here we really must emphasize um, um, a, a quite tangible connection between Macarius and the Cappadocian Fathers. We can see it in the anti-Eunomian platform that they share, and in particular in the struggle against the so-called spirit fighters, those who denied the divinity of the spirit in the fourth century. Um, in terms of um, um, the anti-Eunomian polemic, one kind of interesting connection we find in Macarius, as well as Gregory of Nyssa, is the identification of the image of God in the soul with unknowability. So St. Gregory of Nyssa, opposing Eunomius, of course, uh, emphasizes what we do not know of God, but makes the additional claim we don't even know ourselves. How can we claim to know God? This is precisely the same point we find in Macarius. And also on the image of God um, within uh, humankind, um, both Macarius and Gregory of Nyssa talk about the image in terms of freedom. And this is something which seems to develop in, in Gregory of Nyssa's thinking. I mean, you don't find it in an earlier work like On Virginity, but you will find it in a later work like On the Making of the Human. Um, freedom as one of the constituent elements um, of the image of God. <clears throat> 
And I think there's a, there's a very distinctive uh, connection here. Now, to, to sort of link into councils a bit for a moment, um, in a text of St. Gregory of Nyssa called um, On His Ordination, in Suam Ordinationem, or sometimes called To Evagrius on the Deity, or In Gregory Ordinationem, Gregory of Nyssa, at the time of the Council of Constantinople, no, the Council of Constantinople discussing the question of the divinity of the Holy Spirit, St. Gregory of Nyssa refers to certain Mesopotamians who are credited with renewing the gifts of the Holy Spirit the gifts of the Holy Spirit experienced in the early church. So even in the fourth century, they could talk about the earlier church. They have these people, these Mesopotamian ascetics, left their country like Abraham. They look to heaven. They cut themselves off from human life. They are superior to the patterns of nature. They do not struggle with words. They do not study rhetoric. But they have such power over the spirits that they expel demons, not through syllogistic arts, but through the power of faith. And so this commendation of certain spirit filled Mesopotamian ascetics made in the context of the controversy surrounding the divinity of the spirit at the precise time of the Council of Constantinople, very conceivably a reference to Macarius and his circle, and that's been argued by Reinhard Staats amongst, amongst others. But we can be even more tangible and even more concrete about the connection between Macarius and Gregory of Nyssa when we turn to the connection between Macarius's great letter and Gregory of Nyssa's uh, De Instituto Cristiano, or On a Christian Way of Life. So the Great Letter is one of Macarius's uh, great works. I suppose that's why they call it the Great Letter. <laughs> um, it's a kind of manifesto, a kind of statement of his vision of authentic monasticism or, or authentic Christianity. One of the rather nice features about Macarius's um, ad advice is that although he seems to be addressing a monastic audience, like Basil, he won't refer to monks and nuns, but simply to Christians, simply to Christians. So what we see in Macarius's great letter is a, a statement of his vision of the Christian life um, based on inward experience, inward experience of the spirit, assimilating us to Christ, presenting us to the Father. Um, it's a, it's a full and compelling vision, which seems to have been taken up and reworked by Gregory of Nyssa as his On a Christian Mode of Life. Now, here we have an extraordinary instance of um, you know, a great proper father, like um, Gregory of Nyssa, approving of and circulating under his own name in what we would call plagiarism these days, um, a, a text of an improper dogmatic a uh, non-dogmatic theologian, Macarius. And that particular text, the great letter, has some extraordinarily precise statements on Trinitarian theology. For example, it opens with this statement, which again, I think, needs to be read in the context of the Council of Constantinople. So the great letter, Macarius' great letter, begins by talking about the divine and holy declaration that has rightly been laid down concerning the exact and pious opinion and faith. Faith, that is, in one revered Godhead of the co-essential Trinity, one will, one glory, and one worship of the tri-hypostatic Godhead. This is in accordance with our pious affirmation of the Good Confession before many witnesses in the mystery of holy baptism. So how one would write off somebody who could uh, come up with that kind of statement of faith as a mere pious, mystical, spiritual theologian, not a proper doctrinal theologian, I don't know. So this connection of Macarius with Trinitarian theology in the fourth century, especially in the connection with the Cappadocian Fathers and the Council of Constantinople, I think very clearly shows that Macarius needs to be included in studies of fourth century Trinitarian theology. Now, the next chunk will be on Christology, um, in the, which we associate particularly with the 5th century, but of course there's a lot going on in the 4th century. And I'm going to point out in this second sort of half of the paper that um, Macarius has a remarkably developed theological insight in the matter of Christology, which again merits him recognition, um, not just as a spiritual, mystical theologian somewhere along the side, but as a, somebody who has something important to say in the matter of um, doctrinal uh, theology, in the matter of Christology. Of course, Macarius doesn't get a mention in um, Grillmeyer's Christ in Christian Tradition, which is otherwise um, rather comprehensive. Again, it's an experiential starting um, point. 
Macarius begins with his own lived experience of union with Christ. His writings are profoundly Christocentric, uh, focused on not only the vision of God as light, but also sharing in the mystery of the cross. We also have in Macarius one of the earliest um, homilies um, to exist um, on the Feast of the Nativity. So this begins today. Again, it's the eternal now of the liturgy. Today, the Lord is born, who is the salvation of men. Today has affected the reconciliation of divinity and humanity, of humanity and divinity. Today, the whole creation has leaped. Those on high have been carried towards those below, and those below have been carried towards those on high. Today has accomplished the union, communion, and reconciliation of heavenly and earthly beings, of God and man. He goes on to talk um, about that reconciliation in some detail. We've got images like the iron and the fire, which we know from Origen and others. Um, but I, I really um, emphasize that Macarius is very clear about the unity of subject in the incarnation. Uh, he uses theopascite language, God died language, uh, but never forgets the distinction. So we see a very fine balance, unity and distinction, in this late fourth century text. Sometimes he can be a little bit more apophatic what we, or paradoxical in his approach. He is God and he is man. Note the unity of subject. He is the one who lives. He is the one who dies. He is the Lord of all and he is the servant of all. He is the lamb and he is the sacrifice. He is the sacrificial calf and he is the high priest who performs the sacrifice. He is the one who suffers and he is the impassable. He can also be a little bit more um, cataphatic uh, and even rather precise in his terminolo terminological um, account of the union of divinity and humanity. Um, the Lord is from heaven and from earth, for God came down from heaven and took the man, the anthropos, from the earth and mingled himself with the man. Nothing wrong with mingling language in Christology, if you ask the Cappadocian fathers. Um, he acted thus so as to make from those on high and those below a single church, mingling divinity and humanity. He goes on to say that the Lord produced a new work from Mary, clothed himself in it, but he did not bring his body from heaven. So anyone who knows the period will know that this is an anti-Apollinarian trope. Apollinarian, but not necessarily anti-Apollinarius, but that's another story. Um, it should be obvious that his Christology stands in connection with the Cappadocians, including the anti-Apollinarian um, attack on the idea of the heavenly man, the man brought down from heaven, not perhaps arguably Apollinarius' own teaching. He also shares with the Cappadocians an understanding of the soul of Christ as the locus of the union and as an indispensable component of integral humanity. But there's one passage where he goes even beyond the Cappadocians, I think, breaking new Christological ground, if you like. So he begins by, in this passage, uh, by drawing an analogy between the Lord's flesh and the royal purple. For just as the purple is glorified together with the emperor, and the emperor is not venerated apart from the purple, so the flesh of the Lord is glorified together with the divinity, and Christ is venerated together with the flesh. Speaking of the Lord's flesh as the royal purple, Macarius, I think, is picking up on an image used by his contemporary, Diodor of Tarsus. And in Diodor, the image is used to underline the distinction between the natures. In many ways, it's an unsatisfactory image, the purple, leading towards a divisive Christology, even a suggestion of impaired humanity, and tended to fall out of use in the fifth century. But Macarius um, is actually quite precise in the way in which he uses this image. He goes on to insist that the flesh with the soul and the divinity become one thing, even though they are two. And he goes on to, be, uh, to develop this image of the purple in a very interesting way. So not just the, the emperor and the purple, which is clearly a bit of a divisive image, but the purple itself becomes the sort of um, you know, the, the basis of his um, exploration of what's going on um, in the incarnation. So turning to the purple dye itself, as wool dyed in purple resides in one beautiful form, even though it comes from two, ekthio, natures and hypostases, and it's no longer possible for the wool to be separated from the dye, nor the dye from the wool, so the flesh with the soul, united to the divinity, results in one thing, 
that's to say, one hypostasis, the heavenly God worship with the flesh. And it hardly needs saying quite how striking this passage is in the context of the closing decades of the fourth century. He's taken on the anti-Apollinarian critique of the Cappadocians and coupled it with a stronger insistence on the unity of the two natures. He seems to favor some sort of exio formula, sort of anticipating the, the, the slightly later Alexandrine tradition in the fifth century, but, but retains a sense of the distinction between the natures that is more typical of the Antiochian approach, if we can uh, still distinguish between these two in any, uh, yeah, roughly at least. Now, there's more to be said in the matter of Christology, but I, I think, just to sum it up very briefly, Macarius would seem to be one of, or if not the first writer in the anti-Apollinarian, broadly Alexandrine tradition, to speak of the one hypostasis of the incarnate God coming from two natures. And... Um, this is an achievement uh, that has scarcely been recognized in studies of 5th century Christology and deserves to be recognized in studies of 5th century Christology. Now I'm going to turn now to sort of a, something of a summing up. Okay, I think I've made the point that Macarius is actually quite a serious thinker when it comes to Trinitarian theology and Christology. And he should certainly be included in any doctrinal histories of the 4th and 5th century. But what about um, you know, thinking a bit more broadly about um, you know, modern dogmatic theology, modern systematic theology? Um, would it not be possible to incorporate what we might call a Makarian vision in the construction of an orthodox dogmatics or even an orthodox systematic theology uh, for the 21st century? Of course, as has been mentioned already, um, in someone like Trembelas or Andrutsos, uh, someone like Makarius would definitely not get a look in. I must say, I must look further at Makari Bulgakov, whether Makari, <laughs> Makarius gets a look in in Makari Bulgakov. But um, generally speaking, orthodox dogmatics, um, attempts at orthodox systematic theology until relatively recently, have not incorporated the Makarian experiential dimension. Things, I think, be, have begun to shift with the work of Dmitry Staniloe and Justin Popovich, you know, both of whom try and sort of refashion orthodox dogmatics along more squarely, um, not only straightforwardly patristic, but also mystical spiritual. Um, lines, including uh, Makarian lines. Um, I should give an honorable mention to Sarah Coakley, who has actually one reference to Makarius in her new uh, systematic theology, um, precisely tying Makarius into Romans 8 and the Holy Spirit incorporating us into the life of the Trinity and showing the Trinity not just to be a kind of accidental invention of the fourth century, but something that's fundamental to Christian life, thought, practice, contemplation, um, and so forth. I even started um, sort of imagining um, what an orthodox systematic theology based largely on Macarius might look like, or perhaps an orthodox systematic theology based on the golden chain of experiential pneumatology we see in Macarius, Simon the New Theologian, and St. Gregory Palamas. And it certainly wouldn't begin de deo uno on the one God and then move forward through the Trinity and so forth. Where would it begin? Well, I think it would begin de visione dei, on the vision of God the vision of God as light, and then move through the trinity, understanding of the human conditions, struggle against the passions, grace, freedom, sacraments, etc., etc., and probably finish with De Visione Dei, I think. Um, so start and finish with On the Vision of God, and I'll put a prima pars, a secunda pars, and the tertia pars in the middle, based on this experiential pneumatology. Anyhow, I'm just there asking you to imagine what a a kind of revived orthodox dogmatics for the 21st century or revived orthodox systematic theology for the 21st century might look like. And in particular, a, a dogmatic theology or a systematic theology that not only assembles you know, vast numbers of quotations and citations from scripture and the fathers and so forth, but a dogmatic theology or systematic theology that really tastes of truth. Thank you. Thank you.